Thank you everyone for joining our industry next event today. Uh, my name is Aaron Arnold. I'm a customer success manager over here. Um, so quick rules of the road before we begin. If you have any questions that arise during the presentation, use the Q&A button on the bottom of your taskbar. Uh, if you have any issues that arise, you can utilize the chat icon that's located right next to that. We will send the recording out afterwards uh, to all attendees today. So keep your eyes on that email coming, coming through. And for quick introductions, uh, I'd like to introduce our CEO and co-founder of Entitle, Vivek Joshi. Uh, Vivek has roughly 30 years of industrial B2B uh, OEM sales with aftermarket and CEO experience. And he's really passionate about uh, opportunities that are available for equipment manufacturers, mainly in consolidating their install base and really helping them succeed in their aftermarket. So with, for, without further ado, Vivek, I will hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Aaron. I just realized that uh, every time you make the introduction, your your thing goes from a couple of decades and now it's 30. So I'm beginning to feel like you're trying to add a couple of years every time you talk out here. So I will forgive you for that anyway. But uh, seriously, uh, good to meet everybody. Uh, Vivek Joshi here, as Aaron said, I'm the founder and the CEO of Entitle. And it, I'm excited about the speaker today. I, I've known Anthony for a few years now. I first got to uh, know of him and meet him uh, when he was at a company called Gainsight. He was the founding marketing guy, then became CMO. But I really, really loved what he did with the company in terms of the community, in terms of the kind of stuff they did. And so I've always tracked his progress. And then I guess almost a year ago, Anthony, you started this new company, Audience Plus, or maybe a few months ago. And I was like, huh, this is interesting. Yeah. And the more I got into understanding what he was doing, I said, well, this is the coolest thing I've seen since maybe not quite sliced press, but okay. almost one of the coolest things I've seen in a while. And, you know, uh, this is very much, uh, I would call it, the realm of modern marketing is the way I thought about it. And so I thought it'd be really good for our audience and, you know, specifically industrial companies to really understand how people are thinking about marketing uh, in the technology world, right? I've been fortunate to kind of straddle the industrial and the technology worlds for the last 20 plus years. And the more I look at the marketing work that people like Anthony and everybody else do, I think there's some major lessons and major ideas we can take away from the industrial to the industrial side from what, uh, what they're doing. And so with that, in mind, I thought it'd be great to have Anthony talk to us about uh, the, the latest thinking uh, specifically about own media. Uh, so without further ado, I want to hand off to Anthony, but more importantly, Anthony, maybe give a little more, more color on the background, if you don't mind, uh, as you start yeah. your presentation. That'll be great. So welcome, Anthony. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Vivek. Really, really appreciate uh, just the opportunity to kind of share what we're learning here on, on the, the technology side. And um, I'll, I'll go into my background here in a second, but you know, what, one of the things I think the theme of this session might be like, hey, what are the insights happening from another industry and in technology that can be applied to the industrial industry? And similarly, what's weird is what's happening is even in technology, we're now saying we're looking at what the consumer media industry has been doing and we're learning how that is impacting our ability to grow our businesses, to better serve our, our customers and all of these types of things. So um, a little meta in that way, but the the topic really is this idea that every company, be it a technology business, be it an industrial business, be it whatever it is, is becoming much more like a media company. And we'll try to draw some of those um, uh, insights through. So if we go to the next slide, um, just by way of structure, I'll, I'll give you, you know, to, to Vivek's point, more color on my background and kind of how I sort of came to, to this, uh, to starting this business. Then I want to just go deep on why the consumer media industry, why are tech businesses learning from it? Um, and uh, Vivek will uh, come up and share a little bit as well of like, okay, what, what is the application for the industrial industry as well as we sort of start working through this? And then at the end, I wanted to actually walk through five just tactical things you can do in your business um, to start building an owned media strategy, or if you have one already, help modernize it into this, um, to kind of lean into this trend that we're seeing. Um, and as Aaron mentioned um, uh, from the beginning, any questions you have, please, you know, would love to make this interactive. So please use the Q&A uh, capability within Zoom. So just a quick about myself. So um, I, I, my context is being a chief marketing officer at um, enterprise software businesses within the technology space. So, you know, as Vivek mentioned, I was fortunate to meet him during my time at Gainsight, um, spent a little bit of time at a, a company called Front and most recently a company called Hopin. And what was interesting is that in all three of these companies, I had this sort of a, a different experience than what sort of the, 
the marketing playbook that I inherited was sort of telling me uh, this experience that if we invest in brand and community and some of these things that have kind of been lost as sort of the arts and crafts side of marketing versus the demand gen and paid media and outbound cold calling and some of these other things that have had become tried and true um, that we could actually grow the business in a more sustainable way. And so that became kind of a big part of my, my playbook, kind of frankly, being an early, early in my marketing career, using first principles, using kind of what, what I was sort of learning from the consumer space, just as a consumer myself. And so I had the opportunity to actually uh, publish a book on this, a, a book called Category Creation. Um, and all of these sort of things, I think, has, has led for me personally, at least to, to this moment of starting a company, um, going from operator to founder to really help other companies make the same transition to not just a, do better content and appear more consumer-like you know, to, to their customer base and to the, their audience at large, but to prove that the impact of that work on business outcomes, um, to tell a better story to CFOs and uh, the FP&A team, all these folks who are, are kind of trying to quantify the impact of marketing on the bottom line. Um, and so now I've built a company to, or I am building a company for the last 11 months or so to, to bring this to market. And so the next slide, uh, if you are interested in any of this top, these topics, um, we don't have a product yet. So we're effectively creating content ourselves and we've launched a media property, a media company, um, all about thought leadership around owned media. So if any of this resonates to you, please um, uh, check out audienceplus.com and subscribe there for just some more content. All right. So um, I'm going to get into the actual, oh, I should tell you, excuse me, before we do, um, I think we're going to do a quick poll. So uh, how, uh, and I think there's a poll functionality that's going to come up here in Zoom, but how do you engage with your customers today and, and or your install base today? Um, and so if you get a chance to just run the poll really quickly here. We're running the poll. What, cool. We'll probably give it maybe, you know, 10, 15 seconds. Awesome. We'll give it a chance here. So, so let us know what you're thinking. And this, I think, helps set the context for, you know, a lot of this um, presentation as well. It's okay, what, what's sort of the current state of affairs with how we serve our customers, how we engage them kind of on a regular basis, be it from a sales kind of lens or even more of a thought leadership and content and, and community lens. So i um, definitely curious to hear kind of how the group's uh, thinking about this. All right, I think we got about 60% uh, of the audience who's who's voted. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, launch the results here. Right. Awesome. So it looks like is that 60% of the responses respondents say that um, they customers reach out to us frequently and we respond. So I'm sort of interpreting that as a bit more of a, a reactive type of engagement, but still, of course, a very important one. Um, a bit of we reach out to them, but typically from a place of a, a commercial outreach um, to get them to, to buy something from us. Um, probably another team marketing is responsible. Good. As, as those zero folks uh, have, have done that. And, you know, one person, so 7% of the group said, not, not sure exactly what our current engagement model looks like with customers. So thankfully, you know, there are some trends that are happening that we're seeing in the technology world that again, the consumer media world saw well before we did that is changing this expectation of how we engage with our customers. Um, and it's really pushing us into the, this new way of thinking. So if we go to the next slide what, and just one more. This, this shift that we're seeing is moving from a world where we had gone to market through a very transactional uh, basis we acquired customers transactionally, we served them transactionally to one that is much more relational in context. Um, and a lot of the, the proof points of this on the next slide comes from companies like Airbnb who are, have recently announced that they shifted a lot of their paid media dollars, which for marketers, and this is search advertising and these types of things, is often the biggest line item in the marketing budget. They shifted it away from effectively advertising to building their own brand marketing, so their own content. They're, they're sort of telling their own story in their own way um, and creating content that serves their audience beyond just kind of commercial um, uh, reasons. 
And then more interestingly, perhaps, is HubSpot, which is kind of like the bellwether for us in, in technology, at least in terms of, of marketing insights and, and trends. They stood on stage, their founder, Darmesh, and said that the next chapter of marketing is all about community-led growth. It's about connection, more of an emotive kind of construct than kind of this transactional world that we've sort of come from. And so what are the headwinds that Darmesh and team at, at HubSpot see that Airbnb have seen? Let's go to the next slide. First is that it's getting increasingly difficult to actually reach our audience, be they customers, be they you know, other folks within our, our, our customer accounts or just the market at large, because folks have um, uh, just this sort of information that is available to people now obviously is, is just flooding our, our feeds and our mobile devices, but the formats are changing too. We're not just producing uh, blog posts, written blog content, which was really the hallmark of the, the transactional kind of inbound marketing era. Um, people are watching webinars like this. They're participating in live streams. Uh, you might have a podcast program and, or in your personal you know, consumer lives, listen to podcasts or um, you know, watch kind of short form video series. The, the formats themselves are emerging and that's putting a lot of pressure on marketers to figure out how can we communicate in these channels using these more kind of editorial types of formats. Next one, um, I mentioned this with kind of the Airbnb example, but paid media is increasingly inefficient. It's expensive. And there's a limited number of keywords for us to actually bid on in order to capture you know, the conversions and make those kind of transactions. From my experience, this is actually the cohort of pipeline that doesn't end up converting all the way through revenue anyway. And the hypothesis I have is it's because we acquired them through that transactional means, not by building a more sustainable kind of relationship, which ultimately does take time. Next one, our, our relationship with social media is changing. Um, our ability to get reach um, on LinkedIn and some of these tools organically is limited by an algorithm that we don't control. And if, you know, obviously we saw some tumultuous activity with Twitter and everything and some of these other kind of platforms, um, these things, you know, building on these kind of rented channels where we don't actually own our audience, own those relationships, own the, the distribution into that audience uh, is, is risky. And a lot of folks are starting to say, look, we need to figure out how do we take our audience from LinkedIn, take our audience from some of these other social channels and bring them into a place where we actually have an owned relationship with them, which takes me to the last point. Um, our ability to build a data set around our audience is actually existential for the next chapter of marketing. Consumer uh, data privacy laws are changing and effectively uh, this idea called third-party cookies, which is great for consumers. If you've ever had something in your Amazon cart and then you abandoned it and then you were like, it chased you all over the internet, that whole thing is effectively going away. And, and for e-commerce businesses, at least getting much, much more difficult to do. And so great for consumers, difficult for marketers, because we need to, we've, we've leveraged third-party cookies for so long to get distribution in our content, to build our audience and that, those sort of things. So our ability to build a first-party data set, which is effectively an email address for, for folks within our audience, um, them opting in and giving us consent to email them, which is effectively saying, hey, we want to have this relationship with you uh, as, as, with your brand directly. Uh, it's existential for how we go forward. So go to the next slide. Um, the, the belief that I have is if we are going to unlock this next level of relational go-to-market, we have to sort of like rethink the entire playbook. And a playbook that has worked against some of these trends, uh, some of these headwinds, uh, again, comes from the consumer media space. And by the way, I'm not suggesting we need to become media companies, but we need to start behaving like them um, in order to kind of meet this moment and be more effective in how we reach our audience of customers, prospects, and, and sort of the market at large. So if you go to the next one, and uh, I want to invite Vivek too to, to help kind of as, as we kind of walk through this, but I'll, I'll, I'll start with just applying kind of the con context we have from a SaaS perspective, and then would love to kind of chat just about the, in the industrial kind of space as well. But when we talk about acquiring customers in, in traditional SaaS, we, we've used words like demand creation, as if we are going to have the perfect white paper, the perfect blog post at the perfect time that gets somebody to pull out their credit card or whatever and buy the thing. And that sounds great in theory, 
Um, and in some cases, you know, that does happen. <clears throat> but media companies think about this more as building an audience, which the language there is, I think, an important sort of differentiator. This idea of building a relationship with people at scale who can be customers at some point, you know, within your 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 business. Um, uh, what do you think, Vivek? Should we go one at a time through these? Do you want to um, talk about acquisition? Yeah, I think actually, actually it's interesting. You know, there's a couple of things out here which are relevant to this audience, not just the industrial side, but many of our uh, customers and the, individual, uh, the people we target mm -hmm. are the folks who are running the aftermarket and service businesses. To some degree, they already have an audience, right? If you think about it, these are people who've bought the equipment from their companies. They've been in some form of contact with them, either commercially or for service or whatever. So theoretically, you know, they have an audience. The question is really, what do you do with that audience? And kind of how yeah. do you figure out a way to uh, to uh, activate them maybe, right? Because yeah. the audience tends to be a dormant audience very often, right? So it's about activating the audience is how I think about it. But to some degree, they're saved the headache of building the audience the way the traditional media companies or candidly, for the matter, startups like you and I, right? I mean, we're trying mm -hmm. to kind of build something, but we don't have the the ready-made corpus, if you may, of people that that are out there. And so I think that's what's yeah. the interesting part about it. So, you know, as we go through this, I'd love for people in the audience who are, are listening to kind of maybe give us their thoughts, maybe through the Q&A channel, maybe later on to, to this thing. So I think, you know, that's what I think is the biggest benefit uh, industrials have, right? At least yeah. in, in this situation, right? You, you have existing relationships with an the audience that is known. Yep, yep, yep. 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 That makes a lot of sense. And, yeah, and if you that, think about your, if you think of your experience at Gainsight and the other companies you were at and, uh, and now at Audience Plus, audience building is a really hard part of it, right? Yeah. How do yeah. you get that going? Is And that's the advantage I think the industrials have that they should, in my mind, take advantage of, right? Yeah, uh, totally, so. totally. And I think one, one piece to then you think about is less of, to your point, building the audience, but how can we engage this audience? That's how right. can we take that's them right. from dormant to active, from, you know, um, sort of a, consumer to buyer kind of relationship to a That's trusted right. advisor type yep. of relationship. And so I'll, I'll just call out maybe the bottom, actually, I think the bottom three rows still have relevance here. Absolutely. One is, yeah. as we think about creating content, historically, that content has been written for an algorithm. It's been, and, and again, a lot of this is, is the, the technology con context around SEO for audience building uh, at the top of funnel. But I think this idea of editorial content and thinking about how can we do things that are, are you know, using video? How can we use podcasts? How can we create more of this human connection at scale using these formats to engage our, our existing audience that, that we do have? I think that's a, there's a very powerful, um, there's some per, per, very powerful uh, emotional kind of benefits if we're able to use things that go beyond just the written word. But of course, folks are, are consuming content and people learn in different kind of ways. And so there's different kind of, um, you know, there, there's merit to kind of having an approach that kind of hits all of these. Yeah. But I will say that the lesson I think from the media perspective is how can we use some more of these emerging editorial formats? Yep. Um, on the distribution side, I think this is important too. And it sounds like, correct me wrong, Vivek, when I, when I say owned subscriptions, it sounds like that the, the audience is known to, to folks in, in, in to industrials and that likely we do have an email database that is effectively understanding who these people are. And we can send emails into this database. We can promote when we do have a piece of content or something that we, that we want to get in front of them. Industrials are ahead of the industry of the technology industry in many cases here because they've built the sort of first party infrastructure. You know, the, the interesting part about the first party infrastructure is while they have it, I think, Anthony, the thing I've seen, and I'd love for some of the folks in the audience right now, certainly the practitioners and the industrial side, and I see a few names that I recognize who are marketing-oriented uh, folks out here, is the, the, the main purpose of these first party names and lists are the names of the people they, they know are the end users tends to be about informing them about products or informing them about offers or things yeah. like that versus what I see that you and other people are doing or what I think a lot of people really should think about doing is what are the kinds of different value, uh, valuable things you can share with this yeah. audience? What are the things you can do beyond just telling them about the latest offer or latest uh, technical support bulletin or whatever it might be, right? And I think that's where the 
opportunities in terms of both the content piece of it, uh, Anthony, as well as the distribution piece of it, right? And, you know, yeah. and, the, the, and the technology world has been used to these quote unquote user group kind of things, right? And each user group has its own personas in terms of what they care about and what they like. And kind of, therefore, the content that they need is slightly different. And I think there's there's so many things out here that you can build on that today, candidly, I think is a big missed opportunity, I think, in the industrial world. Yeah, so. that's great. I think later in the presentation, too, we're going to dive in, I think, some principles for that, to, yep. just to give folks so, some ideas. So anybody, I mean, some of the folks in the audience who I know you guys are marketing folks, just think about these things and see how you can maybe... Ask Anthony or comment on some of this stuff as we go through the process here. And uh, you know, I know I see a com uh, some comment in the Q and A, but we'll come back to that in a second. So let's keep uh, let's keep proceeding, Anthony. Sounds good. All yeah. right. Well, uh, uh, the last point here is really quickly, and then we'll move on. Is this idea of as we're creating this content, as we're distributing it into an audience that we own, we're able to understand context about what topics are resonating for different folks within our our audience. What um, what formats do they consume this content in? And we're able to get much more valuable insights as a company, as a marketing team on what should we keep investing in? And of the things we are investing in, how is that showing up on the bottom line? Increasingly difficult to do that. I mean, nearly impossible, frankly, to do that on YouTube or Apple Podcasts or some of these rented channels. And so I think the, the, the kind of core thesis here to really just double down on is this idea of owning that audience, which you guys are Correct. well ahead already is extremely valuable in, in this next chapter for marketing. You know, can I make one comment here? And yeah. uh, I, I know my colleague Rob has uh, said this to me in the past, and he's on the call on the other side as well. You know, there's an interesting word distribution out here, right? In your mind, distribution is about getting to the end user, right? Mm -hmm. Getting the content to the to the consumer of the, of the content, if you may. In mm -hmm. our world, in the industrial world, what's interesting is that actually has a two-part meaning to it, right? One is clearly the mm -hmm. way you describe it. But by the same token, our customers, our industrial companies also use a quote unquote rented channel called a distributor or a manufacturer's rep or a partner to get to that end user. And unfortunately, sometimes that middleman actually controls the flow of information as well and the relationship. So it's actually an interesting way to do it. And one of the conversations I always have with our customers is like, hey, how do you get around this channel, right? Because sometimes there's opacity between the manufacturer and the end user. So yeah. finding a way to get around that without destroying the relationship is important. And maybe, you know, some of this material actually can be used to kind of get around this and create value Absolutely. for everybody in the value chain. Absolutely. So. For going direct potentially right right to, to, to you. Um, exactly. Or perhaps I spent a little bit of time in the channel in my career, but this the, the idea of like standing out uh, to the yep. channel reps or the marketers as a, a brand worth paying attention to because of all of your content and community efforts and all <laughs> these types of things. So. Super, super interesting. And by the way, just on the, uh, one quick thing. We, I'm seeing yeah. a couple of comments. We'll come back to that in a second. So let's go through your material because I want to get through something before we come back to a couple of comments yeah. we have out in the thing there. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Go ahead. So it's so just a couple of proof points here that at least from the technology kind of industry, um, a lot of folks are doing this recently. This is, this is kind of like the, a very timely slide. HubSpot, I believe it was about 18 months ago, acquired a media company called The Hustle. Salesforce has built their own kind of native media operation called Salesforce Plus. And the conviction I have is that every company is going to start over the long arc of time, start deploying a lot of these same principles in order to, A, just you know, be relevant in this new kind of uh, economy that we're, going, that we're in, but also to just build deeper and more relationship, um, uh, deeper relationships ultimately with, with our um, customers. And the belief is that this idea, if we were to package this in terms of like what what do you call this approach? It's one that I think is a familiar language, a term that we've heard before in, in perhaps marketing textbooks of, of years past. This idea of owned media, where paid media has its place, you know, within the um, within the marketing mix. Earned media, from like a PR and communications perspective, has its place. But the fundamental belief I have is that owned media is really what that kind of um, it's almost like the lack of a better term, the, the gateway drug. It'll help us enable this next chapter of marketing that is much more community-led. All right, so enough about theory. <laughs> let's, let's talk about tactics. Um, and so on the next slide, one thing I wanted to open with is this sounds pretty expensive and it sounds like you'll need a big team to, to kind of pull all this off and a lot of budget. And what I want to convince you of, you know, in this next chapter uh, section of the presentation is that owned media can actually be the most efficient uh, way to actually engage your customer base and engage your installed base um, in this next chapter. Frankly, especially if you're not as focused on the building side from an audience perspective and more on engagement, 
um, you can get a ton of leverage at a very little expense. So um, let's pull up the next slide. So these are the five steps, uh, as I see it, to building an own media strategy. And we'll dive, dive in through, to, through each of these and just give a, a couple of um, 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 tactical kind of tips here as we move forward. So the first one, and I think this is actually super compelling for this idea of engagement. Actually, I saw, um, I think, Kevin's comment here um, about the database being really relational built on or the folks within the the database today are very in there from a sales construct or from a context um and so if you go to the next slide um and one more i i think one of the big things that we're learning here is and it, this sounds kind of crazy but i think over time we've sort of lost track of this idea that we're selling at the end of the day to, to human beings to people um, we so often think about, and even in technology, we've been guilty of using language like, you know, um, we're selling to logos and we're, you know, hunting logos and farming. Like we created all this like weird language around it. Um, and at the end of the day, folks who are buying our products and services are trying to self-actualize in their career. They're trying to get promoted. They're trying to provide for their families or whatever it is that they're doing. And so this realization, I think, is an important um, uh, first step towards uh, how we think about taking an editorial approach. It's this idea of defining our marketing, our messaging, not just about what we do, be it our products, not just how we sell, be it the channel or any other kind of you know, uh, uh, methods and routes to market, but why we do it. Um, and being able to articulate our why is a powerful filter for all of our content um, uh, promotions, all of our content kind of work moving forward. And so very tactically, I know this is kind of small on your screen, but um, if, if you spent uh, half a million dollars with a brand agency, they'll give you this at the end of the day. So please steal this. Um, but effectively we call this a brand on a page, but it's this articulation of what our purpose is as a company, what's our core value proposition. And some of these kind of fairly simple concepts, but applied through the lens of purpose and impact. And these types of things, I think, really help um, inspire an audience because so much of our content doesn't have to be just functional around education, which is important, but actually thinking about the lens of inspiring um, and stirring kind of the emotions of the market. And I, my conviction, it might sound crazy, is it, however commoditized a product might be or seemingly devoid of emotion, I think there is still a story to be told here about the impact of that product when done right in the market. So telling that story, I think, is an important step towards kind of um, building and uh, perhaps waking kind of folks within your install base that haven't heard from you in this way before. Um, and it's a chance to really do so, I think, in a, in a material way. So I use that as a starting point as, or, okay, if we've defined who we are, what we stand for from a, from a brand perspective, now we can start producing content to help kind of reflect that. And so on the next slide, um, what the, I, I fell into a sort of misconception as even as I was starting this company where my thought was, okay, we're going to go tell the world to become a media company. We, we're going to produce our own media. So let me go contact an agency and get a quote about producing this like Netflix like show effectively for my audience. Um, I wanted like chef's table for B2B marketing or something, right? I think it, was, it might even be a generational thing with, with millennials. Um, and of course the quote came back at $200,000 for six episodes. Com impossible for me to spend that money as a very, very early stage company. But beyond it, irresponsible for me to be on a presentation like this and tell you, hey, produce editorial content and do it at $200,000 for every six episodes. It just doesn't scale. Now, the good news is what I'd learned after, after sort of having um, this realization is that there's actually a preference for, uh, within the minds of our audiences for authenticity over production value. In fact, production value can work against you. If we spend too much on production, the content feels like a commercial and people tune out. And I mentioned generationally, this is a thing in, in many cases, uh, or what we're learning about the Gen Z generation kind of coming into the workplace after, after mine, um, is this idea that all of the content that they're used to consuming, and, and frankly, a lot of it that, that they've created comes from the iPhone. 
it comes from the um, um, a very kind of low production, but very real way of communicating that content. So I'm not proposing do everything on the iPhone. You know, what we've done is thought about building an internal kind of quote unquote studio. So where I'm sitting today, everything you're seeing here is less than $15,000 uh, US. And the good news is we do this once, we pay that expense up front. Now we can produce a limitless amount of content moving forward. Um, for, for folks that you know might have employees working across the world or not quite having that centralized office space, you can build a pretty high fidelity remote studio for less than $1,000. So I don't think that you need to always consider, I mean, agencies work well if, if that is, you know, um, if you have the budget for that and want to do it, or maybe for the right type of programs. But I think it, it, the sort of like OPEX to get started with this is very, um, CapEx, excuse me, is very little. You don't need a ton of budget to get started. And the good news is after that first time investment, you can kind of run a lot of your content programs moving forward. And I think the other piece to call out here is what's more important than quality is cadence. I think if we produced like a great video asset, released it, and then our audience doesn't hear from us for another six months, that's where that dormant kind of thing can come into play. And we, you know, it doesn't feel like then, you know, this kind of living, highly engaging, um, you know, media brand effectively that we want to listen to and learn from. It feels like, you know, a, another kind of marketing drop that happened quarterly or something to that end. So I think I would sort of just encourage, how can we regularly be releasing content even if the production level is not at the highest clip. All right, so I think that this is a, an important one as you think about engaging kind of the, your, your existing audience. Can we go to the yeah, next Anthony, slide. Can I, can yeah, I make one please. comment on that one? What's interesting please. is when you talked about the investment needed for a studio and stuff, you know, I don't know, uh, I've not been in corporate America in a while now, but almost every company that I've been in, any decent sized company had some form, maybe it's not a media room, but some form mm -hmm. of a room where it was, capable of being a quote unquote studio. You know, it could be a training room. It could have been a training room with some form of uh, green screen capability, right? Like you said, you don't need yeah. fancy production equipment, but you have things. Uh, a lot of these companies now have good uh, audio equipment for their own conference calls and or yeah. webcasts and or whatever, right? So there's many ways to, to quote unquote hack that production infrastructure that, you know, yeah. startups like you and I don't have, right? And there's right. again that uh, little added infrastructure benefit uh, that comes with being a bigger company. Absolutely, so, an unfair yeah. advantage, right? If you unfair have a, yeah. a space that has you know no, no children running around, which is something we battle <laughs> exactly. for us here. Like <laughs> you know, like having a, a dedicated infrastructure, setting it up, you know, wired in, you know, from an <laughs> Ethernet perspective, all of these things uh, help. And, and when you look yeah. up market on the technology side of the industry to the sales forces and others. Absolutely. They have Salesforce studios, like folks have really invested quite a bit. I think that what I want to share is like anywhere from the thousand dollar, like improved webcam and, and better lighting in your home office to Salesforce studios within your corporate HQ. Um, it, it's just becoming increasingly easier and cheaper and added to the benefit of, um, and when, when thought of through the lens of authenticity, um, you know, I think that helps kind of guide a little bit of the production uh, idea kind of vision. I'll move a little faster through three and four, just given that, you know, the majority of this audience wouldn't be as focused on building audience. But just to give you a, a, a sense, um, what we're learning is that, you know, the idea of being where our audience is, there's a lot of wisdom to that. They're on LinkedIn. They're on some of these other kind of rented channels. And the, the strategy is just st starting to shift where earlier we said, well, we just need to sort of have a presence on Twitter and, and Instagram or whatever, all these things, you know, I think LinkedIn most, mostly, um, and appear relevant, build our followers of our page. And I think all that still makes sense. But I think that what media companies do really well is they think about social media, they think about SEO through the lens of saying, I need to convert as many people that are following me into owned subscribers to build and fuel the subscriptions, uh, uh, our subscription business. And the way to do that is actually very hard because these rented channel channels don't want you to do that. They want to keep you on property and they don't want to link out to a third party website or something to that end. And so a lot of the things that we're learning is how can you actually compete against the algorithm of these channels? And one of the bits is to build what has been called algorithmic capital, 
by posting regularly and keeping people on property. So playing by the rules on LinkedIn, right? Making sure we have content there that isn't guiding them elsewhere. It might be a video that's natively uploaded or something to that end. And then as you sort of build up your algorithmic capital, it keeps sort of um, um, rewarding you for playing by the rules. Then every week, bi-weekly, whatever, we promote a webinar just like this or a ev virtual event or a blog post on our owned property or whatever that sends people back to, to your owned site. And so we're sort of like building up the equity and then like degrading it a bit and then driving the conversions off, off there. So we're learning a lot about this. Um, and of course, it's always changing. But I think the fact that it's changing so much just speaks to the why we can't build our, our businesses on these rented channels. We have to build that owned relationship. Um, and then finally, one last, maybe quick point here. Uh, what I have found works very well on if, if, if LinkedIn is a network that your audience is on using short form video clips. And so imagine recording a webinar just like this and then finding like those insights that hopefully, hopefully, there, hopefully there's a couple of them, but like some insights that are, are really valuable, chopping it into like a 30 second or less video, posting it in the feed. So as people are scrolling, they see that short, that short form video clip, it captures their attention and then they might link out in the comments or whatever to watch the whole episode on your own property, maybe even behind a subscription. You know, um, quick sides there, quick sidebar comment, Anthony, in the short form yeah. stuff, stuff. It reminded me of my customer who told me uh, that they now do training videos and the little short form content, right? I mean, the old ways training was like these crazy long PDF manuals of actually worse paper yeah. than, than PDF. And, you know, training videos, it lasts on forever. And now they tell us, nope, we're doing like 90 second hits because this is a TikTok generation. We got to yeah. go at them differently. And I found that fascinating. So there's a lot of content that people can create uh, that doesn't necessarily have to be exactly this uh, media, yeah. quote unquote, media oriented stuff, but it can be valuable to people. So anyway, just an anecdote for you. Absolutely. Oh, that's awesome. That's such a great, great anecdote. All right, uh, really quick, yeah, so build an owned audience. I won't spend too much time on this one, uh, given the group. But I think the maybe one takeaway is um, when I think about our industry, we see an average conversion rate on our website to something, it's something like 1.1% on, on average for B2B SaaS specifically. And what we're typically giving people is a button that says talk to sales or watch a demo or something to that end. The average consumer media uh, website sees a 10% conversion from traffic to subscriber. And I think it's because what they're, and I think one of the comments earlier alluded to this, what we're positioning to them is an offer, not just to buy something, but to learn, um, to get educated, to get inspired, um, at least in the consumer media space. And so as we think about how would that construct kind of come into our own world, um, perhaps it's less about, we, we obviously care deeply about capturing you know, demo requests or whatever, talking to sales or what have you, but can we also give folks an ability to subscribe um, to hear more from us around some of our content and community efforts. And by doing so, what would happen from a, imagine, you know, a 10 X improvement in, in web conversions, like what would that mean for us as a brand? Um, so I think it's an important kind of um, takeaway here that none, this stuff isn't just meant to be, again, the, the soft side of marketing, but I think a very powerful way to uh, improve performance overall, which takes, takes me to the last point. Uh, how, we can sort of start telling a story around this engagement around our database on the business outcomes. And so imagine taking the example of perhaps a dormant uh, database of customers or install base who um, we have a commercial relationship with, they know who we are, we know who they are, but there isn't this sort of emotive um, connection around education, inspiration, th these types of things. Um, what's powerful is you can start actually, since you own, you're the, the owners of that, that database record to really dehumanize it, we can start to understand context for what are they interested in across different topics of the content, content that we're producing. And as they're getting more engaged and, and, and overall, um, you know, coming back for more, watching more, sharing more, uh, commenting on things that we're, we're producing, we're able to understand, okay, well, what does it take to, to go from dormant to active? We can map that journey. We can make better content decisions of, okay, well, it, we know that these posts or these topics or these formats are really the ones that move a 
um, a customer that's known us for years into someone that's become a raving fan. Um, how can we model that and repeat, make that a repeatable process based on the content that we're producing? Um, for the pre-sales team, this is powerful because uh, customers, again, this is um, um, perhaps a bit of a technology use case, but um, folks who are acquired through these kind of relational means have a higher propensity to become customers and not just customers, but to renew, to buy more from us over time, to sort of go on the record and share their, uh, their advocacy with us um, out into the market. And then for customers, um, you mentioned that example around training, which I think is a very powerful use case here. How can we think about engaging existing customers who are already using our products to move them through to, to a better adoption of the existing products that we've sold them or to buy more from a upsell or cross-sell perspective? And so our content, when we're thinking about it through this lens, be it a short form video clip, 90 second video clip like that, that example, um, or something that's a bit longer form, understanding those insights, chronicling what exactly are the contributors to movement within the customer life cycle, we start modeling that success moving forward. So um, all of this stuff has to show up somewhere in the, in the funnel um, and ultimately in the bottom line. Otherwise it's not, um, you know, not impactful. Okay, so that's it. These are the, the, the five things we're thinking about. I know I moved through it um, a little bit quickly. Um, I wanna make sure we save some time for questions. So um, you wanna pull up one, actually there's one more side of things. Oh yeah, just finally, if there's any questions that you guys have, um, you know, join us on Audience Plus. Again, it's free. We're talking more about this stuff. We're learning together, kind of trying to build in public here. Um, and so happy to share more insights there. But I do see some questions coming through, Vivek, if we want to start tackling. Yeah, them. yeah, absolutely. So uh, there's a question about uh, a comment I talked about seeing data on existing customers and how can we use that to customize messaging, right? So to some degree, you have customers, you have almost segments of customers, you can understand their needs and how do you kind of make that as, as uh, the question puts it, mass customization, right? Yeah. Uh, using this audience to deliver mass, uh, mass produced but custom uh, content. Yeah. yeah, I think there's, so um, there is this sort of like trend around personalization at scale, using data, using, um, uh, you know, some machine learning work to actually recreate web experiences based on um, that uh, that usage or the, the sort of the data that, that you have as a brand. There's a company called Mutiny that's doing that pretty well, I'd say on the sort of website space. Um, candidly, that's a lot of the work that we wanna do as well, Audience Plus, um, from a content perspective. How can we inform the content roadmap based on some of that engagement data around formats and topics and all these types of things. So. But 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 validating, I very much think that's the future. There was a, a conversation. Uh, I was at a conversation yesterday, and somebody said, "I, I think the days of one-to-many marketing are coming to an end, um, and the future is all personalized marketing made for one person that is receiving that message." Um, and I think that's we're, we're perhaps a few years away, but a very powerful idea um, that, that I think is is going to come true. Yep. Uh, see a few other questions in here. Um, next one is: Does it make sense to tie up with an external agency or company? Yeah. So I, I'll and then Vivek definitely interrupt me on this, but um, I think on the agency side, um, I mentioned. I think I, I the way I explained it was like build it all in house because um, typically I think that a lot of what we're hearing today, at least in Silicon Valley, is this idea of marketing running much more efficiently than it did in, in certainly in the last few years, but but maybe ever before. So I think like going from zero to one is pretty easy to do in-house. However, there are plenty of agencies that specialize in this. And if this is something that you do have a budget for, absolutely, like working with agencies to, to run your entire podcast, to do all of your social clips and editing and, and promote it even on your behalf on various rented channels. Um, there's a lot that can be done there. And on the company side, reading a little bit into the question here, Kevin, but the idea that... Um, if there's partners within your ecosystem and co-creating and collaborating on content together, there's so much power in kind of leveraging two things, their brand equity that they bring together into your world. And so maybe the channel and distribution partners have a, a play here as well. Um, but even so beyond that, accessing their install base. And so if you're co-promoting uh, a webinar just like this or whatever, you know, um, a live event or a specific piece of content, being able to share that engagement data 
by proxy, you're actually growing your audience as well. Um, so, so I think both are, are, are great strategies to, to deploy. Uh, one more question. So we have a captive install base. What are the first steps we can take? Yeah. I, I mean, I would go back to the five, um, items here, but I think the one piece that I would, I would ask about is captive through what context Cap captive through the commercial context or captive from a place of education and inspiration and, and all of the, these other things? Like, can, are they learning from you beyond the, you know, the products that you sell? Um, if the answer is yes, then, then that's amazing. You're, you're well on the way um, and continuing to think about, you know, all right, let's make one content bet perhaps that we haven't done before. Maybe we've written a lot of white papers. Maybe we've done a lot of the kind of written word. Maybe we should launch one uh, episodic video series where every month, every two weeks, whatever, we drop one new episode and start getting a sense of uh, how is our uh, install base actually engaging with this piece of um, content or this program. Um, but I think if, if not, I think that's the big shift. It's sort of moving from um, just this selling kind of motion to more of this education or inspiration motion. Great. Thanks for that. Um, so one more just came in. How much time and resources do you think will be needed to build this type of community? Yeah, it it, uh, it depends. I would say, um, you know, we're two, two marketers here at Audience Plus, and barely any budget, maybe zero. Um, and we've been able to build an audience of about twelve hundred or so people in three months. So just to give you real data, real context. Of course, we're super dedicated to this and are big believers in it. Um, but I, I say that to say I don't think you need like to hire a head of editorial and um, build a newsroom and, you know, get, you know, half a million or million dollars of budget to make this successful. Um, I think it's, I think over time, there's definitely a compounding effect of time. Um, just the, the network effects of humans and, and, and our uh, install base. And certainly if you're, you know, doubling down on, on rented channels like LinkedIn. Um, so I think some of the stuff will get better and improve in time, but I think you can get to a pretty critical mass of, um, of, of building a, a sizable audience, um, you know, with spending, you know, very little, uh, building an in-house studio, just like we, we had discussed, um, or working with an agency, what, what, whatever you prefer. Um, and I think it's just a matter of kind of getting started. I don't see right. any other questions. Vivek, did you have something? Yeah, no, I don't have a question, but I think there's a couple of things that, Anthony, you said at the end, which I think are really important to note, right? You don't need to start with this big, grand audience in mind or at hand. Yeah, Start small, right? I mean, I think the whole notion of being able to just start something small, starting to create value for that audience and that let that snowball is important. Um, you know, and not everything and everybody has to turn into something commercial right away. I mean, I remember the example you gave yeah. me a couple of days ago when we were talking about the fact that when you're gain set, people who show up to your events and people who show up to your forums and whatever it might be and did do diddly with you for a longest time and then they suddenly went yeah. somewhere else and then became, you know, raving fans and, you know, customers, yeah. right? Brought us and it's about, yeah. yeah, it's about starting small and getting this thing going. And I think, yeah, as you know, in a sales process, we always tell people like, look, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So you start now, you're going to get somewhere. So it's just just time to get going. Start something. Right. That's yeah. where I think about everything you've been talking about today. Totally. I think that's right. Good. Well, listen, awesome. we're at 1150. Uh, I know we uh, had budgeted this for 45 minutes. Uh, uh, we can still keep this open for a couple of minutes if you want. But Anthony, I know, you know, this is uh, this has been really, uh, really valuable. I don't know about you, but, you know, one of my uh, customers has you know, been texting on the side and he thought this is one of the most high valued hours he spent, right? It's really awesome. interesting uh, capti uh, capturing the the attention of the people out here. So again, when I looked at the attendee list, there's a bunch of people I recognize who are commercially minded and they, they want to learn more about this. So folks, yeah. uh, you obviously you'll get to get the recording, but Anthony's given you lots of interesting tips and tricks to kind of get going. This isn't hard. This is just about getting your first foot in front of the other and to get underway. And I think that's what the, you know my takeaway from this is this. And it's really, the, the, to, to some degree, applying modern marketing to uh, uh, what you call, uh, to the to the industrial world where we come from. Yeah, so yeah, that's, me. that's great. Good. Well, folks, I think if there's no other questions, uh, I, first of all, Anthony, thank you very much for doing this. Of course. Uh, I appreciate me. it.
yeah, I think this is exactly this met my expectation and then some in terms of the content and how we'd uh, be able to use it. And folks, appreciate your time today on the, on the to join the call. And uh, we'll be sharing the recording with you in, in, uh, within the next 24 to 36 hours. So thanks, everybody. Have a good day. And uh, we'll talk thanks, to you everybody. soon. Thank you, Anthony. Cheers. Bye-bye.